Okay, I think I've found it. I have found the best possible episode of Murder, She Wrote for me, a person who partakes in video games and also adores murder mystery. Just... <laughs> Just look at this. This is everything I've ever wanted in my life. Everything I've ever needed. Jessica Fletcher playing a virtual reality game in a murder mystery show. I've hit the top and I don't want to climb back down. This episode is one of the more well-known in the series due to pop culture osmosis and memes. You've no doubt seen this clip before, but can you tell me exactly where it's from? No! Sit down, Murder, She Wrote fanatics! I know you know. I'm asking the rest of the world, not you. This gem of a scene is from episode 5 of season 10 titled A Virtual Murder. Believe it or not, there is in fact a lot more going on than just this hilariously optimistic vision of VR sets in the 1990s. It's so lightweight and small! Said no one. This is what a VR headset actually looked like in the mid-90s. As the episode starts, we see Jessica discussing something with Seth, one of her lifelong friends and Cabot Cove's doctor. He kind of goes into old man yells at cloud mode, expressing disdain for video games and technology in general. Not sure how I feel about hearing a doctor shut down new ideas, but Seth has the tendency to be crotchety. Jessica, however, is her usual sanguine self and explains to him that she'll be writing the script for a new virtual reality game called A Killing at Hastings Rock. It's a bit disorienting. As if you're visiting this strange, almost alien place. It's rather wonderful. I like her positivity. Let's see what the game looks like. Wow, it looks like a shitty point and click. Ah, nope, it's not a point and click at all. It's a pixelated video that resembles the worst parts of Phantasmagoria. Jessica seems to be enjoying her time in the simulation, maybe a little too much, when one of the characters begins to glitch. <laughs> This causes a lot of distress for the developers. They need the game to be ready in the next 24 hours for a press presentation. The main developer, named Michael Burke, is played by Kevin Sorbo, otherwise known as Hercules. Wait a minute. This isn't my world. Disappointed! He also strongly, strongly resembles Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux. It's uncanny. So there seems to be an egregious problem with the game. One of the characters, a server who's offering some very questionable hors d'oeuvres, keeps bugging out. What is this, though? It looks like some pumpkin puree and Canadian bacon on a cracker with a side of flowers. Okay, so I found out later that they're hot dogs? What? I'll miss those little hot dogs. <laughs> no. Jessica tries replaying the scene where the game glitched, but alas, it's still not working, causing a lot of needless drama between the developers. Michael says they need to reprogram the servant girl, and I'm just like, what? Why? It's one bug. Just fix it. How is the whole character screwed up? And even better, just remove the character. One of the other main programmers, James Lindstrom, seems especially pessimistic about the bug and suggests canceling the whole conference. That was my reputation on the line. Cancel the reception. Alex, a young intern, proposes changing the script, and Jessica follows it up with what I was hoping they would all do because Jessica is in fact amazing. Would it create the same danger of a cascade if I were to simply write the servant girl out of the story? There isn't a lot of time to fix the story, and the servant girl has a slightly large role in the game, but Jessica is determined to make it work with the assistance of Alex. Meanwhile, as James makes his way to his Corvette, man, Corvettes were ugly in the 90s, we see a private eye snapping some, dare I say, very sexy photos. Look at this guy serving GQ Man of the Year. While helping Jessica with her script, Alex makes a few quips about how protective James is of his source code, or his source codes, rather. I designed a program to test the game at high speeds. But Lindstrom, the prince of paranoia, nixed the idea because I would have had to have used his source codes, which he guards like Fort Knox. I don't buy this. You can't just hide the source code from people, unless this is a very shitty working environment. Wait, gaming company with a shitty work environment? Never mind, I buy it. After some sappy office romance between Michael and Sharon, who was responsible for the servant girl glitch, we see James and another gentleman named David Salt show up at a company named Redwood Concepts. James is intent on selling his source code to this company, which is why he was hiding it from the rest of the developers at Marathon Images. Because he has some leverage on this CEO, he can afford to ask for a large sum of money. It seems that the Justice Department has a very keen interest in the rather gross methods you employ to convince casino owners to use Levitt slot machines? This guy, a criminal, no way, he looks so innocent. Also, I'm sorry, I can't look away from this guy's chin. It's so mesmerizing. The CEO is determined to get James's source code and I really have no idea why. These guys are acting like they're nuclear codes or something. If you had Lindstrom's source codes, the ones he wrote for Marathon's VR game, you wouldn't need him at all. 
please stop saying source codes. Jessica successfully rewrites the script because she is not an amateur, making a few minor script changes last minute. James is annoyed with her tinkering and starts waxing philosophical about binary. The beauty of the binary system is that everything is reducible to zeros or ones. It either is or it isn't. Clean, precise, exact. Words that hardly apply to human behavior, wouldn't you say? You know what it does apply to, though? Murder. Murder is definitely binary. You're either dead or you're not, James. Jessica retries the game with the implemented changes, and it's starting to look a lot like Twin Peaks. Not a complaint, mind you, a Twin Peaks FMV game would be damn fine. She also decides last minute to make a change to one of the weapons in the game. No problem, this is game development. Just bring up the weapons UI and click on sabers and it's pixelated magic. It also tickles me that she gets 1,500 points just for talking to a character. Intense. During her playthrough, Jessica discovers a locked door that she can't remember writing into the game. She asks to have it erased, but both James and Michael say it's too risky to mess with the program. Well, a locked door that cannot be opened is unfair to the players. I mean, they'll assume that it holds some significance. Jessica would make an amazing game designer. Like, are you hearing this, Roberta Williams? Straight from Jessica's mouth to your ears. Jessica does not endorse moon logic. And when Michael explains that there's nothing they can do to change it, she responds with understanding and empathy. Jessica, it's too risky. I promise we'll fix it after the press reception. I understand, Michael. So she's a great puzzle designer and doesn't explode when somebody shoots down one of her ideas. Jessica is the best person alive. So James is dead? <laughs> nice. I am so glad he was found in the VR room during the press conference. It's like a death scene from The Colonel's Bequest or The Dagger of Amon Ra, finding the body in an appropriate yet bizarre location. Wow, he was even wearing the headset. We're talking about murder on the Disorient Express, am I right? That is the best fucking joke ever, come on! A detective is called onto the scene and everyone is interrogated about who may want to kill for James Lindstrom's code. Michael Burke suggests checking out John Crowley, the CEO of Redwood Concepts. Detective Del Canto decides to follow up on some leads and suggests Jessica stay in contact. I was wondering what a celebrity like you was doing here in the Valley of the Klingons. Kapla! Okay, let's speed this up a bit. The detective questions Crowley, who seems very cocky, doesn't even provide an alibi. The murder weapon, James's own gun, is found in a bush with Michael Burke's fingerprints all over it and he's arrested. Jessica doesn't buy that bullcrap. She gets word about the private investigator that had followed James around and questions him. She pretends to be interested in hiring him, but it's a ploy. Ha! Don't hire this PI, he's easily tricked. Tell me what it is you weren't telling Michael Burke. Turns out he's been collecting information from the people he was hired to spy on and withholding it from his clients, instead selling it to the highest bidder. She also decides to speak to David Salt, who is present at the meeting with James and Crowley, and he explains that James was just rather crackers and in general provided no help whatsoever. Oh well, let's do some hacking. Alex decides to try and crack James Lindstrom's software password so they can see what was exactly behind that locked door in the VR game. I've run my random character generator, my password algorithm, I've never met a computer I couldn't crack in less than 10 minutes. Okay, well, ridiculous UI aside, at least some of those words were sensible. Jessica ends up cracking the password herself by guessing. They open the door to reveal an ego. A massive, massive ego that seems to be reeling out of control. Oh, man. I hear that. The truth to my accomplishments will be discovered by computer hackers like yourself. James leaves a riddle behind the locked door, meant to be found by hackers. It's a vague clue, but Jessica seems to believe it involves a virus purposely put into the game. <laughs> Goddamn, this is confusing, but whatever. The important part is that Jessica and Alex come up with a way to lure the murderer out into the open. At first, the episode is like, oh, is it this guy? Is David the killer? Is your mind blown? And then the episode is like, oh no, it's this woman. She has the source code. The source codes. Stop, 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 stop saying source codes. Put it in. Girl. Sharon was in love with Michael and knew that James was trying to sabotage his game with a virus, and apparently this was such a big deal that she killed in the name of her lover's legacy. I... <laughs> I just... We all remember that this is just a shitty looking FMV game, right? Remember the bologna hors d'oeuvres? We know that this is not worth killing someone over, right? I'll miss those little hot dogs. She nearly kills again when Jessica and Detective Del Canto interrupt. Jessica explains that Sharon's plans backfired when she made mention of hearing a page being announced during the murder. The only way that you could have heard that page was if you were in or near the VR booth 
with Lidstrom. Also, that is the cleanest killing I've ever seen. No blood. Impressive. For the record, I do not recall any of the beeper evidence being discussed. It was foreshadowed a lot, but I was too distracted by the weird technology and character dialogue. What I can say with certainty about this episode is that, all of this weird shit aside, it does have a better, more complex story than the previous episode I reviewed, and the acting is superior. It's actually kind of jarring to see something borrowed someone blue, then follow it up with this because it's so much less wacky and doesn't have an entirely ridiculous plot. So yeah, that was A Virtual Murder from 1993. Now you can see this clip and know exactly what it's from. And what it's from is the most amazing Murder She Wrote episode ever. Trust me, if you watch this, you will not be disappointed. Hey everyone, thanks for watching my episode review on a virtual murder. I do hope you check it out. If you want to see more murder mystery content, I've linked some on the screen. And if you liked this video, then like it, because I'll like you if you do. I also have a Patreon campaign if you need to get rid of some extra money. Links are in the description. As always, see you in the next one.